Welcome to Unleashed, where MMA icon and power wrestling titan Dan, the Beast, Severn, and Eric Carroll deliver a knockout punch of raw, unfiltered talk. Unleashed. Gear up. Gear up. It's Beast Mode. I was in San Juan, Puerto Rico, wrestling in a battle royal. I was 19 years old, wrestling Andre the Giant. And Andre, you know, would wrestle drunk pretty much quite a bit. <laughs> and Andre was the real big old, lovable, friendly giant. But he was, you know, that's what he It, it would be scary if something just went, went wrong. I mean, if he just happened to simply just sit down on you or something like that, if he just don't know how many ribs yeah. he could break on you or, yeah, no. Yeah, it just seems that that way. Actually, Andre, uh, well, anyway, he, he uh, I went to charge him in the turnbuckle, and he just picked me up, and I thought he was going to throw me over the top rope, but he lost his balance and fell into the top rope, and the, it was right across the small of my back, and it just burned right then. I thought, you know, or, you know being 19, I thought, oh, that hurt a little bit, you know. <laughs> then, then he threw me out of the, over the top rope, but I mean, uh, I, the next day I was a little sore and it went away, but now that pain in my lower back comes about about every morning. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> quick, quick little reminder. Yeah, remember way back then. Well, we're going to remind you more and more here, a little bit more current times. Oh yeah, trust me. It's okay. I, I look for a few things just to rub on here, rub on there, just to kind of help grease grease the joint so I can keep on a moving. <laughs> oh, you think that stuff helps? You rub that stuff on you? Know, is it well, do you any good? I, well, there is a uh, one product I, again. I don't know if you know about. It's called DMSO. Oh yeah, I, my told me about yeah, that. yeah. I learned about that at the Olympic Training Center back in 1976, and I I'm a big believer. I I use it all the time. I recommend it to all kinds of people, and and they've had great results. So well, yeah, yeah. that that stuff is like really penetrating too, yeah. right? Like, yeah. But yeah. I don't think the other stuff, the analgesic stuff, is really that as penetrating as that stuff. Well, so there are some newer products that are coming out uh, with CBD and that into it. That uh, um, th there's a couple of lines that are, that actually are, are pretty good. That uh, I love you know, it. I know. me too. Yeah, I love so it. Again, it's, it, that's one of those touchy little subjects because it just all depends on what state and stuff like that or country that you, you live in as to what what is good for you, what's not good for you. But it's kind of going. You know, I don't want big pharma to keep telling me what to do or what to use. I don't. I don't trust those sons of a guns. <laughs> <laughs> I remember, brother. Me too. Yeah. Kevin, I just wanted to say how much I appreciate you doing this. I have followed your family for so, so long. Uh, over the past four years, I've been to Dallas probably over 40 times. And the first time I went, I uh, told one of my friends, I asked him if I could borrow his car. And he said, what for? I went and visited your family's grave. Um, it's meant so much to me. World class was the best pro wrestling I think I've ever seen in my life and they don't make it like that anymore. I find, uh, I find oh, the history of your family so amazing and you have been such an inspiration to me. Um, I just wanted to let you know that because I think you're amazing. So oh, thank, yeah, you. Thank, you. thank you for saying that, buddy. I'll tell you, you know, I, all you can do is your best, you know, and, uh, and it was, it was so hard, but when I heard that, that our fans were a lot of these latchkey kids, you know, they're, Parents would work, so they would come home, lock the door, and when the parents got off work, then that's when. But the kids were really alone until then, and that's when wrestling came on. I heard it so many times, you know. And my brothers and I knew that, so we wanted to always say yes sir and no sir and yes ma'am and be respectful and some things like that. And but I'll, I'll tell you, you know, after decades, you know, we're men and none of us have are without fault, and it just. And the media loves to put you up on that pedestal, but they love to cover every bump when you come down, you know, and you're going to come down publicly. Yeah, uh, yeah. I, I think that's just proven Newton's law of gravity. Whatever goes up will come down. <laughs> so sometimes a little bit harder than what you were anticipating. <laughs> Kevin, I'm sure there's a lot of people that are just now learning about your family and going back and watching that old footage because of the movie that just came out. But I just want to reiterate and uh, ask you, for somebody that didn't grow up with it and that didn't see it, just how big was your family in that Texas area? Well, uh, you know, we're kind of different. We really, we never did have uh, agents or anything like that. It was just uh, 
call my dad, you know, and he set it up. It was really that easy. And, uh, and so, but, but we were never pushed on any grand scale at all. We were just grassroots, but the Texas and Oklahoma and Louisiana and Arkansas and, and all the way up, you know, East. And so it was just uh, organic. It was natural. We, we never did play big shot, you know, anything like that. We tried to be everyone's big brother or the someone, everyone's son, oldest son, kind of like, you know, and just, which we, we wanted to be um, decent, you know, and not, and talk about what's right and wrong and no, not, not talk about it, but I mean, obey certain rules of society, you know, for those little kids that were watching like that. But, you know, it's a lot of pressure, but you know, that, as far as our popularity, it was, uh, you know, when we did a whole lot of these spot shows around here, we, we call them spot shows. We do it for like every week. We had a non -char a charity show on Saturdays and we got to where we did two a week. And, uh, Oh, we raised so much money for schools around here, but you know, we go back to them year after year. And so I make su such good friends like in police department and fire department, you know, the guys that were backstage, you know, we, Got to, those are the most level-headed guys in any community, you know, and I've got to see all of them and uh, make these friendships all over the state of Texas and Arkansas and Oklahoma and Louisiana. And it's just, uh, it was really natural. Nobody pushed anything. It just kind of happened, you know. It just, word came out. I mean, everyone that knew my dad respected him my, and loved him, too, because my dad was no bully or the movie makes it look. He was really... Not like that. That was something I wanted to bring up to you, Kevin. I was there opening night watching that. And, you know, I don't want to poo-poo on the, the, the director's efforts. It looks like he did a lot of studying and looked into it. But I, I felt very uneasy about the portrayal of Fritz. Uh, you know, I, I think it's easy. I, with you guys being stars and, you know, and, and these kids growing up and that was their heroes, I'm sure when these incidents was happening with your family, they want somewhere to, to put the blame. Like, you know, why did this happen? Uh, it yeah. was the eighties. You guys were huge in that area. I'm sure we've all made our mistakes. I'm sure the brothers did as well, but it seems like it was easy to point the finger at Fritz and it was done in the movie. I was curious to know how you felt about that. Well, you know, it would have helped if they at least called me, but I didn't hear a word from most people. You know, British, you know, and I mean, uh, they did a, a good service for people. You know, it was a wrestling movie. It was, you know, about family and all. And, and so I didn't want to ruin it by, you know, disagreeing with this or these little details. And so I kind of let it go, but I told you how bad my hearing is. Uh, I watched the movie, but I couldn't understand the, the audio, you know? So I was just pretty much saw the visuals, but I'm used to that. That's why I don't watch movies anymore. You know? So I told, you know, Sean Dark and I'd watch it, you know, and, but I really didn't hear it until I, I put my earplug things in and uh and then I, I had some real problems with it but it was a little late i just you know gave him my blessing because you know who why would i you know throw a fit about little details when it's uh it's a movie it's entertainment they took 20 10 years and tried to squeeze it into two hours and you know take some lead gave him some leeway over that you know yeah and um you know, just when it came to Fritz, there was there was a couple of things I was thinking about. But I think it's easier for the audience and people that are watching that to forget that Fritz lost five of his sons. That could not have been easy on Fritz. I can only imagine what that did to his mental health. Uh, what was that like for your dad after the tragedies happened? Well, uh, man, I'm glad you're asking this stuff because this is so true. And, and let me tell you. Uh, one day my book is going to come out and I'm going to write a book and we'll do a, a real movie of the Von Erichs. And I'll tell you that it was a family. We loved each other. We adored each other. I mean, if one of us had a football game, everybody was there. You know, it was one of us had a, a amateur wrestling match. We were all there. You know, it was like a, and we didn't do it because out of a sense of duty, we did it because we really couldn't wait to see how it went. You know, we really just, loved each other and uh and so you have to think now dave and i were the two oldest brothers and we we uh, i was the oldest brother and and we pretty much kept our little brothers you know coming up strong but dave and i were on the road so much and that left carrie 
you know, was pretty much at home with Mike and Chris. And uh, Dave and I were strict. We didn't take any uh, shortcuts. And we insisted our, our whole family. It was uh, Vince Lombardi posters all over the walls. Winners never quit. Quitters never win. You know, uh, everything was about competition and uh, getting better, a little bit better every day. It's an athletic family. We were always trying to better ourselves, you know, get stronger, not not to look in the mirror, but so that we'd be better wrestlers or we could get our way in the ring, you know. And so uh, know that it, it, maybe at first glance you take uh, people like they watch this movie. It, Fritz was the most honorable good man I've ever known. And uh, and we loved him so much. And, and so Dave and I weren't at all that way, but Kerry was – Kerry was born right after Jackie was electrocuted in uh, New York. And he was the next baby born. And my dad, to him, I think it was Jackie all over again because that crushed him. When, when that little six-year-old boy died, my father was, um, it pulverized him. He was really just done. My mother, just, it killed both of them. My mother had just lost her little brother months before that to a brain tumor. And she got married, you know, and my, and my, so they'd moved on, but you know, it broke her heart. She loved that boy, the baby brother. And then Jackie dies in 1959. It was so hard on both of them. And my father says that he was coming across the peace bridge up there in New York and a car really came close to him, almost hit him or something. And, and he pulled over and talked to God. He said, God, if you'll just get my family back to Texas, then I'll, I'll follow you the rest of my days. And, so my dad left New York right after Jackie was killed and went down. Was to, he loved to hunt and fish. So he went down to Corpus Christi, the University of Corpus Christi down there and where he'd been in college. He, you know, a lot of information here, but he lost his scholarship at SMU because a married player, player couldn't compete in the AAU back then. So he went to the University of Corpus Christi and finished up his uh, eligibility. It was a really good discus thrower. And so uh, he and my mom were going to live down there, Corpus Christi. And, and, uh, but on the way down, he stopped at the Sportatorium and had a wrestling match with Ed McLemore, the old Sportatorium. And thank goodness he did because it started the ball rolling. We bought a place up in Dallas and uh, eventually took over the promotion too and uh, bought Ed out. And my dad had Dallas, Fort Worth, San Antonio, Austin, Corpus Christi, and I would say San Antonio and Austin, but we had some competition down there but uh, in Houston. But uh, eventually, we completely saturated all the area and all around us. It's a really popular show. But I, I was wanting to go back to my dad, and, and it really, you know, how bad it destroyed him. But I want to tell you before that, you're we talking about my brothers, and I want you to know that uh, Dave and, and I were the way we were, but Carrie was a little more easy on Mike and Chris. And when Dave and I would get home from college and find out certain things, we knew it was wrong. And Kerry was an, a freewheeling, happy, fun-loving guy, but a terrible example to Mike and Chris. And uh, I believe that's how drugs got into all this. And the, because they, my brothers, I mean, I say my brothers, not Dave, Kerry, Mike, and Chris, uh, if Kerry, if... <laughs> They were so ashamed of themselves being arrested. Kerry, take, take Kerry, for instance. He'd been arrested. He'd been forming those. Uh, well, Mike, okay, Mike died before Kerry. And so Mike was the brother that died right after Dave. And uh, that, you know, Mike was our baby. We loved Mike. He was so, so good. But, uh, he was, when he got that incision in his shoulder, he dislocated his shoulder in a match in Tel Aviv. He was strong. He was going to do great. Mike was a really good uh, high school, junior high athlete. He set all these records as a kid. We thought he'd be, you know, the best of all. But Mike uh, got this toxic shock syndrome in his shoulder. His fever went up to 106, 107 degrees. It was crazy. But And we prayed, and God gave us Mike back. He didn't die, but he was brain damaged. And it became more and more evident as time went on. And uh, when Mike didn't die in the hospital, like all the doctors said he would, he told us, he said he was 
like Hezekiah. And you remember Hezekiah in the Bible, God had found him lacking and was going to kill him. And he prayed and asked God to extend his life. And he gave him, what, 15 years, wasn't it? He Hezekiah. And Mike, I didn't know he knew the Bible that well, but when Mike came out of all this, he said, I'm like Hezekiah. And Mike knew that he was going to die. I think he knew he wasn't healthy. When we'd wrestle, he'd get a black eye. Instead of it being gone in two weeks, he'd, it'd be there a month. And he wasn't healing like he used to heal. He didn't have his reflexes. And and I think Mike felt like we're a family wrestling business. Of uh, He got arrested for a joint. They found a joint in his pocket. And he was so ashamed. We just signed a deal with Von Erich Bright Enterprises. We're going to, they owned the Cowboys. And long story, but in Mike's eyes, he really let us down. He really let the whole family down. And he committed suicide for that. And it wasn't my dad. It was Mike's own feeling of guilt and all that. But being on top with drugs, it, 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 you feel miserable about something like that. But you don't have to kill yourself. But with drugs involved, you can't expect re rational behavior. Yeah. And so Mike died. And so Kerry came along. Now, Kerry has this motorcycle wreck where he lost his foot. He was hopeless. He felt like he was a freak, crippled. He he spent three or four hours in the gym a day. I mean, working out. I, I never spend that long. I'm an hour and a half or an hour. I'm, I'm done. You know, but Kerry would stay. It was just that important to him. He, he was he had a great body. And uh, that's what he did. But he had after that bike. Rick, he felt like he was a freak, that he just, just, he wouldn't take his boot off around the wrestlers. He wouldn't shower after the matches. He, in fact, I could tell you some stories. We love to swim in the ocean. And uh, I hate to break this. I want to tell you what, how it went, but I'll go back and tell you about us being in the ocean. But so Kerry felt like that, and he commits suicide over the feeling of failure, uh, doubt, fear, doubt, guilt, all those things hell sends you when and he, they just, those errors that would have bounced off at a time, he was doing drugs. And so they sunk or killed him. I mean, Kerry killed himself out of shame and guilt like Mike did. Mm -hmm. And my brother, Chris, it was hopelessness. He wanted to be a pro wrestler like us so much. He was tiny. It just wasn't going to happen. His bones were brittle. I watched him break his arm. And he just knew it wasn't going to happen. But he had begged God to let that happen for him. It just wasn't going to be. And he killed himself out of that hopelessness, but it was tinged with drugs. And just to reiterate on that, Kevin, that was pressure that Chris put on himself, or was that from Fritz? It was from Chris. I mean, Chris, without a doubt. None of us wanted Chris to wrestle. He was, he, you should have seen the kind of cartoons he could draw. He was a great little artist. And, uh, <laughs> We wanted him to like, he could, it, it would, we could have done so much with that, you know, but instead he wanted to be as big as Kerry. And it just, wow. Kerry had always been a natural athlete. We'd all been natural athletes, but, you know, we've been drilling ourselves every day of our lives too. And uh, I don't think Mike and Chris realized the price that me, Dave, and Kerry paid, you know. I mean, we, we had a father that was rough on us, yeah. And if we screwed up, then we knew he was going to kick our butts if he caught us, and he did. And we knew we had it coming, and he kicked our butts. We respected him and loved him for it. I mean, the you, you can call it what you want. I, mean, I spank my kids, you know, and I'm not yeah. going to let any man tell me I'm not going to either because I know what's right, and that's the way I'm going to be. But uh, my father kicked our butts too, and uh, we had discipline. And discipline is important for any man. What's known as repercussions for your actions. I mean, it's... Uh... You know, we, we live in a very weird society nowadays where, you know, kids think they could say and or do anything. And to me, that all falls back on parental upbringing, uh, good, bad, or indifferent. But to me, you know, simply to simply say, uh, you know, go to your room or you, you we're going to take these. There's such uh, subtle type of things that uh, we, the United States has raised a very, a very fragile society. In, I know. In yeah. And I, I, I was always, I was raised the same way that, that you were, Kevin. I mean, my father, you never wanted to get, let, let my father get to, to three. Okay. The first time he goes, there's, there's like a warning shot, a warning shot. And now there's follow, there's follow through. 
So yeah, I, yeah. I, I thought my father should. My, my father's form of punishment was was a swift kick and hind end, and I, I thought my father should have been an NFL place kicker because that was quite the boot. Yeah, <laughs> the my kicked, we got kicked too. Yeah. <laughs> But, um, I, I did. I always said that uh, one day I could be. I go. So I'll have a hump on my shoulder, and people are like, "Oh, Dad, where did where, where this hump come from?" I go, that's not, that's not my. That's not a hump. That's my, that's behind it. But but my dad put it up here for me. <laughs> yeah. I think maybe this that helped us when we were becoming wrestlers because I remember when Dad would uh, if he he wouldn't want to take his belt off, you know. Because sometimes we'd be out in the field or something. You no, know, he he didn't want us to to get the the pond water in our ears. We had a lot of ducks. You know, he's afraid of those amoebas and yeah. all. And so, but boy, if he caught us, he'd come down on that truck and beat our butts with that whip with his belt. You know, and yeah, so yeah. No, I've okay. I, I I've seen that 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 hand going there and, and the belt. Oh, I've seen that before too. It's like as, as you say that. What what I'm curious about is what was it about professional wrestling was it because of, of what your father had been done i'm just wondering like how, how all the brothers went into this legacy of, of professional wrestling. because I, as i'm listening to you talk earlier you, you guys had other skill sets of football and and wrestling and and uh which again that that'll even be yet another question like going i i hate watching a lot of wrestling products today because there's no wrestling all it is is punch kick shoot them off in the ropes clothesline Stop on and make a the marquee said professional wrestling. When are we gonna do a little bit of wrestling? When are you gonna take some up, put them down on the ground, do do some actually something on the ground and that I, I don't see that exchange. Well, that's where I grew up in for sure, but uh, but I, I but I'll just tell you that I, how I think it may have the, we we're talking about how discipline, <laughs> how my father's way of discipline. I remember when, when he would come up on us, you know, and he couldn't he didn't want to take his belt off, so he'd kick our kick us. And yeah. so we we pretend that hurt a whole lot because it was way better than that belt. So oh, yeah. it helped us in wrestling. Oh, oh, no more, no. <laughs> yes, the, 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 the foot was nice, big and broad. Where you know that belt, it, it, it bites, it bites in there. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Kevin, uh, did you or your brothers ever get a whipping that you didn't deserve? Because I, I, my dad was a pastor, six foot nine, and I got my butt tore up. I didn't like it when it was going on, but I look back now, I deserved every single one of them. Yeah, yeah, you know, that's the way it, I guess it's supposed to be. But, uh, you know, I, I try to, uh, with w watching all this, I watched the show King of the Hill, you know, and I think, he, what a Texas guy that guy is. Except when he, he says he doesn't spank his kids, that's not Texas at all. <laughs> because when I played up in North Texas, I came, most of my teammates' dads were the same as mine, you know. They were. It's just, that's how it is. It, it almost seems like the Bible gives us this, way of raising our family and way of conducting your life that seems like everything is perfect works just right i don't know why they don't follow it because it would be like you know if if, if you withhold discipline for your son the bible says you hate him you be, look what life he's going to live if he comes up in this world without discipline yeah. controlling himself and uh so i thought that's strong language but when you think about what kind of life you're damning him to then maybe that's a good word, you know. Spare the rod, spoil the child. I heard yeah. that many times yeah. from my yeah. dad. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Kevin, I'm, I'm curious, you know, because I've seen in the movie and I've heard in different interviews about Carrie's situation. And I know, like, seeing that on there, I thought it was a little too much. What kind of shape could you explain to us what that was like, the handicap with Carrie's foot? Um. Yeah. Kerry was tough inside. Kerry could take anything. And so we figured he'd be fine. I mean, it, the pain was excruciating, but, you know, after years, you can put that in the back of your mind and, and get off of it. But there's a, when nerve pains is when you have the white flash and you kind of lose yourself for a second or two. That's, that's when you really hit that, you know, Kerry was getting to that point. He couldn't walk on that. But what it was is his foot wasn't cut off. It was cut off from the heel, from the toes on. He still had his heel. That's what I was wondering because they had it like up above his ankle. And I was like, there's no way that could have been possible. So it was yeah. all the way up to the heel. Yeah, all the way to the heel. There's nothing nothing past the heel, though. Okay. Did he have a prosthetic? Yeah, he did. 
You did. But in, in order for that prosthetic to work, though, you have to lift, let the calf muscle atrophy to the point where it gets a suction. And I mean, it's got to, it takes, it happens quick too, but to carry, that was devastating. I remember he used to work on his calves, you know? Yeah. What kind of athlete he must have been to be able to pull that off of those years? Because you couldn't tell. He was a badass. He really was. Um, another one the thing I wanted to ask you about was Mike really a musician? That was my first time seeing anything like that. Oh, he sure was. Was he? Mike was a really good musician. As a matter of fact, I thought that that that, that uh, the movie might touch on that kind. It did a little bit, but Mike was way better than the guy in the movie was. <laughs> he could play. Um, I mean, he played at my wedding. You know, he played yesterday. You know that song. The, he sang it really good too. He, he was a good. He was a better guitarist than he was a singer. But, but it was he had. He really did have a knack because he worked at it. You know. I want to ask you about somebody else that had to be very instrumental in your life is your wife. I mean, she stood there with you and has been through this thick, through thick and thin, and uh, got to be an amazing woman. How did you guys actually meet? I don't think it was outside of the sportatorium, was it? Yeah, it wasn't. It sure wasn't like the movie either. No, um, you know, I went to high school and I had my sweetheart, her, and then I went on about in the world. I went to Japan and Europe and the Middle East, you know, and uh, I met all kinds of girls. I went to college, played football at North Texas for a long time. And I mean, there are so many beautiful girls at North Texas. I'm sure there still are, but there were then too. And, uh, and I just wanted to be able to choose from, from a lot of girls, you know, and I went and looked everywhere. But um, I never could get that feeling that Pam and I had when we looked into each other's eyes and talked, you know, where we she was the companion of my youth. And so after several years in the business, I, I just married Pam. And we had Kristen. And boy, let me tell you, this might sound terrible because I guess I, I'm one of those type of guys. But, you know, I loved my dog and I loved hunting. You know, that was my life. But, and I love my girlfriend too, but she's never in front of the dog to tell the truth, you know. I mean, she, I drove the car and she's riding the back. My girlfriend at North Texas, a cheerleader, she rode in the back. And, you know, ever, that's just, I love my dog, you know. But when, uh, and Pam and I got married, she still was behind the dog. But once she had my baby daughter, Kristen, she was elevated to queen of my castle. And I mean, I say yes, ma'am, to my wife every day. Now, yes, ma'am, no, ma'am. And you know, I want to be an example of my sons, but I'm telling you, I, she is my queen, my queen of my castle. And uh, she makes me the king of my castle. It's natural the way it should be. She's a she's a really good one. I'm so lucky to have her. So lucky that she's tolerating me this is long. So <laughs> 40, 45 years old. Yeah, 45 years. It's, it is a very tough life uh, on a, a, a married couple just because of how many days you usually go out on oh, the road yeah. and uh, it's really tough. It's tough on the family yeah. unit. And, uh, you know, I, well, I, I, I've been, yeah. I've been guilty of that, that absentee parent uh, a lot that, that I, I always would tell my, my, my children, I, I'm only a phone call away, but it's not the same thing as being there and holding them and, you know, watching them in their sports and things of that nature. So. Oh yeah. It's just, you know, uh, we, I just adore my sons and adore my daughters. I just, everything they do with, and my grandkids, their children now, I'm the, I'm that way. If it, when they grabs my finger for its monster trucks, or we're going to go catch bugs, you know, we're going to, I go, you know, I, I have no priorities higher than him, you know? And, yeah. and uh, but I'll tell you that uh, later this week, I think the 29th of March, I'm going to be in Fort Worth at the, uh, uh, at the Will Rogers auditorium. And, uh, and I'm, I'm going to be speaking there, but I'm going to, uh, uh, I'm going to have my, I'll have my grandson with me. I forgot what I was telling you about that. Uh, but anyway, anyway, I'm going to be there at the, uh, at the Will Rogers auditorium and on March 29th, what I've been doing, you guys, is this movie came out and I, it, there are a lot of people who are important to me and I'm the people of Fort Worth and Dallas, you know, I grew up there and I grew up all, all around here. So I've been going to these cities and I've been telling people what my dad was really like and what my brothers are really like. And I don't, my, my dad does not deserve the kind of name that he's got. He's such a good man. And I, I owe him my best. 
And my so brother, so you're, you're, you're going, you're, you're being booked for different types of speaking engagements so that you're able to go there and people can do Q&A and, and ask random questions about, well, you know, again, how, how we're asking about the movie. And, you know, a lot of times, like, you know, a lot of my questions always come from, you know, sure, I, I, I could see a movie, but they like going, but that's why, why, why I, I go right back to, why did your father go into this industry? Why did all the your, your other brothers and that go into this industry when, you know, it, it, from what you've already told me already, you 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 were you had athletic skills in football. You had athletic skills in amateur wrestling. You could have gone a lot of other routes. Have you had, have you had any other types of occupation work and stuff like that? Because you know, I'm well. That's a, that's a logical question, but uh, I didn't say this part. My dad, uh, be, after Jackie died, he became a totally different wrestler. He, were, he was just a college football player wrestling. But when Jackie died, that pain inside my dad, it seemed to come out because he, he was a vi the most vicious man any, anyone wrestled. If you wrestle my dad, you could see the boot laces all over your chest where he kicked you and chopped you. And it was just sold out everywhere it went. People loved it, but they'd never seen a man violent like him. I remember when we would come out of the matches, they would the fans that would be outside before the wrestlers car parked their cars, they'd boo, boo. They'd boo to the uh the bad guys. But when my dad came out, dead silence. Nobody booed. They were scared <laughs> of him. And it was like and my dad uh, the way I'm looking like, Dad, are you gonna the, you know it was like What's going on? I think everybody respected my dad like that. That's really how I grew up watching. He's like, uh, he wasn't uh, violent at all, but he. it seemed like whenever someone would argue with him, he made the perfect point. It was like, like you know, before you go to sleep at night, you think about what you said and what people said to you, and you're, oh, I wish I'd have said that. Well, my dad was the kind of guy that always thought of that when it was time. I mean, he said it right then. <laughs> You know, he was right How important is that for you, Kevin, to make sure that his legacy is protected and that people know that real story about your dad, Fritz? Well, man, it's just how it ought to be. It's how it's got to be. If I'm alive and kicking on this earth and I'm letting that go about without it being corrected, then I'll answer for it. And I want to know that I've done my very best and that my dad looking down on me if or when that time comes, I want him to know that that I poured my heart in it. I did my best, you know, because he sure doesn't deserve it. He's the most honorable good man I've ever known. And he was never the kind of things he would do. He would buy uh, car seats for people that couldn't afford them or glasses for the children that couldn't afford them. And he would like do it in somebody else's name and stuff. You know, he didn't want the reward. He would just do that stuff. And and God would bless him. I'm sure God just bless him. I, I, I don't know if my dad even knew God was blessing, but as generous as he was, that's why I don't think why he was so successful because he was so good and and not for a show either. It was just the inside of him. Me and my brothers knew how he really was. And like when somebody had come to my dad and they'd pour their heart out, kind of stuff dad had say, we just listened to him, you know, and man, that's the way a man is. You know, you keep your word, you do what's right and the hell with everything else. No, he Sounds never like the world could use some more Fritz von Erichs right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we, we got kind of a, a crazy world now where, um, you know, people can identify as anything that they want to be. They can be, uh, yeah, I wake up in the morning, I, I, I identify as a squirrel, <laughs> I identify as a as a Furby, an animal <laughs> creature. I think, oh my god, that, that's called mental delusions here now, is what yeah. that's called. <laughs> Can you imagine being a 250 pound fat guy and, and all of a sudden you decide you're going to be a girl and win the weightlifting competition or the yeah. wrestling competition or something? What, what the heck do they want to win it? Yeah. <laughs> but the, 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 okay, but the sad part about that is the people around them that allow it. It's like, oh, come on now. It's, it's like, it's one thing for that individual to be a little bit, you know, cuckoo, cuckoo, it's like that. But it's like going, you know, uh, you oh, guys are going to pander along with this and agree with it? No, no, no. You're you're part of the problem here now. It's kind of yeah. like going, there's some, somewhere along the way has to say, uh, no, no, yeah. Oh. Well, you know, I, I have to say, I have a lot of fans that are gay and I love them. I sure do, but I don't think I'm talking about them when I'm talking about some 
guy that's, you know, a big old strong guy, or that swimmer, a 6'4 guy that pretend he's uh, some kind of champion because he can outswim the girls. That's, you know, I, I don't think I offend any of my fans when I say something like that because that's just plain wrong, black and white. No, last time I was in Dallas, it's actually who I met up with was Riley Gaines, who lost that. If she didn't lose, they tied, but they told her that he had to get the trophy or he or she had to get the trophy and that she was not allowed. And she had been working for that her whole life. You yeah. know, that's so unfair. Those girls, you know, and being an athlete and paying the price, I just imagine a girl doing that because she can high jump or she can put the shot put or something, getting up in the morning when it's raining, when it's freezing, you're still doing it, you know paying that price and then getting denied at the at the pedestal. That was just terrible. Just just uh, within in the last few weeks, so Eric and I had an opportunity to interview a young lady from Tucson, Arizona. And what she did was just the opposite side. She was a female. No no gender change. She was a female. Claimed it. She, she held her rights of being a female, but she went into boys wrestling. And went to the state championship and won the state title. She's now, bad. <laughs> to hear that, that to me is incredible because I know what a disadvantage she would be at. There's a big difference between a man with bad strength and stuff like that and she being a female and being in a sport like that. And to, to what win. age group? What age was that? 17, I believe, was it, Dan? Was, or 16. Was Audrey? It? Yeah, you're saying what her age is? Yeah. Well, it's, no, no, I just mean it, it, it sounds incredible, you know. No. God bless her if she could do that, but, you know. Yeah, no, she, she, she's she's a like senior. Her. Yeah, no, to answer your question, Eric, she was a senior in high school because she, upon, uh, I just know that from what we were saying, she's going. She's already had, has a commitment to go to uh, Penn State University. So, I mean, she's, she was a very, not only was she just a great physical athlete that, that accomplished something that, that I would claim as being almost impossible, but she also, what a sharp cookie. She's already uh, has a letter of commitment and she's going to be going to Penn State University. So she's already planning out her future, which there's, there's a lot of young people. They don't have a clue as to what they're going to do. And, but, but she was really sharp and she was on point and, and, you know, it was a wonderful interview that we had with her. So. Well, yeah. Her. Yeah. yeah. Um, Kevin, I'm curious, like over the years, seeing everybody talk about your family, the interviews, movies and stuff like that. You're one of the last ones left or you are that can tell the true story of what happened. What has that been like for you mentally? What kind of toll uh, that must be? Because that's has got to be rough. Well, you know, uh, in a way, but there was a time when I was like, uh, you know, I was I was not a very good businessman. You know, I, I spend money on what I need it on, you know, and uh, and I didn't save a whole lot, you know, but I did buy real estate. And thank God I did. But, uh, you know, I, uh, when I gave it, when I quit trying, I just I could I, to me. I was a failure. I, I was not a good big brother. I was not a, you know, I lost my brothers and I wanted to go to Hawaii and get over it. You know, I just wanted to go to Hawaii and get in the ocean and be by myself a while. I had to take my sons there, you know, and, 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 and I, you know, I, have, I healed, that's where I kind of helped healed, but, but I really did see myself as a loser and I just wanted to just, uh, I just knew that, there had to be a better way. And then after, so after Dave died, I was searching really hard. I needed no answers about God. I need to know what was really going to happen when I die and where is my brother now and all. And I have such peace now, but I had to know, and I have, believe me, I, I will see my brothers again. And, and, uh, my, and, and it's, a uh, and I've given it all to God. My decisions or what God would have me do, what is his way and not my way. I just, and in and, and that, I found such a peace and a joyful life by, let me, I've been, you know, a rich guy and I've been famous and I've been guest of the honor and all that. But what's really, 
rewarding and good is to hear my children laugh and have dinner with them all together. And, and oh, that's just way better than anything else. It's just, I'm totally content. I look forward to every new day, you know, every day waking up and, and life seemed to really kind of get to wearing me down. And I bet a lot of people are the same way, but maybe the movie will have some kind of an impact on people because all that stuff that Kev went through, I still wound up getting out to Kauai and having a beautiful family of 27 acres and just my children live there. And, uh, and, you know, we have foster kids too, but, uh, uh, just a beautiful life, just loving each other with no pressure. Planes don't fly over. My phone doesn't ring, uh, or I don't answer it, but it's just <laughs> a great life, you know? And, uh, and it wouldn't happen if I was still run, running the show. It wouldn't happen when I was doing it my way. I was getting worse and worse. While taking that break and, and finding that healing, was there, like, did you miss pro wrestling or was it something that you just had to completely pull away from? Well, you know, I missed being in good shape, you know, because when you wrestle like uh, five, six, seven nights a week, you know, you can't be sore. I mean, you're sore until you take your, you get thrown your first time in the ring. Then everything's, then you're, you're lively again. You're fine too until the next morning. Wrestling is about being suffering every morning until you get in that ring and take a few bumps and the pain's gone again. But when you retire, that pain stays around, you know. Uh, <laughs> yeah, sure it does. Well, so, I mean, Kevin, just for what uh, you, what, what you said previously there, what, when Eric asked you a question, you're, you, you're, you're taking on this new mission in life because, because of the movie stuff like that. It now gives you that opportunity that different groups are bringing you in for speaking engagements, Q&A, to where they can ask a lot of different specific questions questions but at the same token you're getting across the message that you want people to understand about the von eric family and you know what what your parents were all about what uh what what you're you're all about what 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 your brothers and stuff like that were all about so it, it's like you're you're on a great mission and and everything i've heard you said it's it's, it's like oh, fantastic I don't know if there was a, a point in time where you were a little bit more in one direction, a little bit more, but you know, I could tell you're just a man, of, a man of God. You've got God in your heart. And then that's what, uh, you know, I, I've had ring name the beast Dan the beast Severn. Okay. It's kind of going, I go, what does the beast that God have? And, and, and I, go, I go say, you, you understand. I go, I, I am a God fearing man. And it, it's one of those things that, that, that it's like, I've always said my prayers as I walk out to that, when I, whether I walked out to a ring or whether I walked out to a cage, I always said my prayers as I'm walking in to help me to watch over me, take take me to and from this ring safely is all I'm looking for. I'm not looking for victory. I'm just simply you know looking to be go there and come back safe. Yeah, you know part. that's how simple it is, isn't it? Something men's rules are what screws it all up. Yeah, you know, we just oh. from God, all the, the don't eat fish on Friday and all these other and those crazy more of them. But God didn't give us those rules. That's what we've put on us. Yeah. You know, it's so simple. He stands at our door and knocks. Just open the door. And you know, that Bible is not just a book. When you pray and say, God, make this real to me, and then read, man. Open up and you, you can just you can just pull out that that uh, one piece of paper that that gives you like the ten commandments and that that, that, that might be a good outline for the rest of your life. You know you don't have to read much more than that. It's because a lot of people, you know, uh, you know they look at the the, the Bible again. It all depends on what edition of the Bible again. But but still, there's a lot of reading to it, and it's uh, you know I just tell people, well, you get, there's the, there's the easy little leaflet that's uh, one page. 10, 10 little lines right there. <laughs> if you, if yeah. you pay attention to those 10 little commandments, uh, you might live a pretty good life, you know? <laughs> yeah. This so. might be hard to answer, but I mean, I'm just curious, like if, if this wasn't to happen with your brothers, Kevin, where do you think world-class would be in today's pro wrestling? Uh, that's speculation. I think that uh, we had a really good thing going with our matches being such a tough tempo and such quick pace and, you know, our matches didn't drag, you know, they went. And so, uh, you know, could only, could only guess, but I know the ratings that are back in the eighties, when we were really rolling for those years, then, uh, we beat WWE in New York city. We had higher ratings than he, even in New York. And, uh, we beat WWE, we even beat Saturday night live head up. 
I mean, we had a high rated show. I mean, what was it like watching all these years later, stars like Stone Cold Steve Austin, Ultimate Warrior, all these people that passed through world class becoming some of the biggest stars in the business that there had to be a sense of pride knowing that there was seeds planted from your father's territory. Yeah. Well, let me tell you, you know, uh, we did have, seems like we had all the really big names, you know, but uh, in order to make it in wrestling, like they, like these guys said, you've got to be tough. You got to be tough on yourself. And our guys, they are tough, but you know what? I got to say, when you ignore injuries, and just, you know, tough it out and ignore the pain, ignore the pain. One day it's going to come back in a big way, and it's kind of irresponsible. You have to go ahead and listen to your body and those injuries and get them dealt with instead of being a badass and toughing it out till you drop dead. You know, it's just yeah. a lot of our guys and a lot of the, those these guys are indeed badasses. And then there's, I was in a car with Jesse Barr one night, and he goes to sleep with his head like this. And he can't straighten it up. It turns out he broke his neck the other night and he's just been tolerating it, you know, all this time. It, it's wow. just, and what are these polar guys like that, you know? Yeah. yeah. But you gotta, you gotta take care of injuries. You can't just ignore them. Back to like today's society, you know, you got these kids that are wanting to be influencers. They're wanting to be famous. And that's really pushed in this generation. Uh, I, I think a lot of people, once they get fame, they realize it wasn't all that it was cut out to be. What was that like for you having that fame back in the 80s, Kevin? Was it something you enjoyed? Because it seems like it could be a little bit of a blessing and a curse. Well, you know what? I, what my brothers and I enjoyed about it was it really was friendship. You know, it was, you know, it, it, when it gets to be so many that you're going to be crushed or something, you know, that's that's one thing. But but even then, it's from love. And so I remember my brothers, all the same thing. We'd tell the police, don't hurt them, don't hurt them, don't hurt them. You know, that's what we'd be saying because, you know, there's so many and there and it's getting scary. And Israel, you know, it, it was <laughs> my life was on the line a couple of times. You know, I'm telling you that it, it's just a, a crowd like it's friendly. It's love. They really just want to touch you. And so uh, you can only have good things about it. It was as far as it was kind of a pain in the butt because I couldn't go to movies or go shop, you know, like that, but Kerry, Kerry, one time put a sheet over his head and made it look like an Arab, and he got away with that for a couple of times, but he got caught and had to sign a bunch of. <laughs> Did you guys really like eating that pizza in back then? Oh yeah, I love pizza in. That was a good place, and they gave us a big stack of cards to give people for free pizza. You know. Who doesn't like pizza? Come on now. That's a <laughs> yeah. I remember Joe Spillman and uh Roger Gertz. Uh what nice people they were. That was a great company. How much do you love your fans, Kevin? I really do love them so much. You know, think of this. What other sport would have fans that get so excited about good triumphing over evil? You know, this is something hard. The heart of our people are so darn good. I do love them. I sure do. They want to see right over wrong, and that's my kind of guy. I want to talk about your sons for a second, seeing them come up through the business. What's that been like now? You're the father watching your sons. Uh, what's that experience been like for you? Beautiful. Every step. I wish I could slow time down because I just – uh you know, I hate to be a bummer, but everything we see is going fast. You know, your beautiful moments are happening quick. So, man, drag them out, make them last as long as you can and and try to think more reasons to make more memories. You know, that's what I would suggest to people. Make memories, make good memories with your loved ones and let the and don't waste time arguing with your wife. Mm -hmm. Love her, man. Forgive her. Let it go. Whatever it takes to have peace and love in your home. And just, <laughs> I'm no, I'm no teacher, but let me just say, I, love is the greatest force of all. There's nothing like love. You make love number one in, in your home. I, when, when I was in Kauai, we had this big old brother, you know, a, a Samoan guy and his, his brother, uh, there's a helicopter crash and that helicopter flips over and it's got his brother pinned under a ditch. And this one Samoan boy went over there and he lifted that 
thousand pound helicopter off of his little brother and, and people say, oh, that's panic. Oh, that's adrenaline. No, that's love. That's God is love. And he got that helicopter off his brother and it was just, he knew what happened. It was, so just remember, there was no force on earth like love. You know, forgive and love because it's all going to be over so quick. You know, enjoy it while you can. Uh, Great message right there. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I know, Dan, you did your stint in the WWE. I'm curious, Kevin, why did you never go to the WWE? Well, because uh, wrestling's been very good to me. But uh, like I told you, family is what's the most important to me. And I've been blessed where I can make pretty much the same money they make in WWE to keep my real estate business going. And I have a, a, a – is you know, I could make pretty much as much as traveling on my own. You know, I've got my passport. I go to Japan, uh, and Mexico, and the Caribbean. I, I used to, and uh, and just just to keep the uh, the machine moving. I didn't make as much money as you know as the guys now at all. But uh, but you know, I made enough to uh, to buy property and, and and let it appreciate and and sell when I did. And so that's a a good thing. But uh, you know, uh, there's a lot to be said for wrestling. You know, the kind of wrestling I would do is, uh, you know, pretty much just get in the ring and show off. You know, I just jump off ropes. I mean, nothing hurts me with the, uh, you know, the crowd and all. And you feel so good. And then the next day you feel sore. But you think, well, this is what I do for a living. And so do it again. Do it again. Do it again. <laughs> that's, that's, no matter what you, what you do for a living, you're going to get tired of it. Mentioned in all the places that you went to, what was your favorite place to wrestle? Uh, well, I love Israel. Israel? Well, I have a story to tell you about Israel. I went over there after the October 7th massacre. In fact, I just got back the other day, you know. And uh, so the I met the pre President Herzog over there in 1985 when I was there. And, and now his son is president, and Isaac Herzog. And wow. so he invited me over, and they took me down into Gaza and showed me some of those kibbutz where the Jewish people lived. And, oh, where those, um, some of the stuff the Hamas did, you guys, I, I mean, horrible stuff. I mean, satanic evil. This was the most wicked. They killed 1,300 people. They still took hostages. They killed most of these girls. They're saying they got hostages, but they've already killed most of them. They sent the girls they didn't want back, but they, it's terrible. It's terrible stuff, you guys. I, go on and on. But I wanted to tell you that the other day I was doing a podcast like this and one of the guys, the speakers was, um, I think an Arabic guy. And, you know, he said, you know, he had a different take on the, on, on the Jews. And I thought, but, but it came from, but we, we both agreed that the person that started this intense hate between the Jews and the Palestinians is a dead man that died a long time ago and told his kids, you hate those Jews, hate the Jews, hate the Jews. And they grew up and they grew up and their children and their children. And now this hate is so insane. It's not about a land war anymore. It's not about anything. It's just about killing Jews. You know, Israel has tried a two state solutions over and over. And it's no way it's going to work because Palestinians do not want peace. They want to kill Jews. Yeah, I mean, is, I'm, sure, I'm sure there are good Palestinians out there, but it, what happened with this, this thing was the people were part of it. It was okay. just, I've been talking to soldiers, you guys. Yeah. So, so sometimes you just wonder, what do they read? What is their propaganda? What is their Bible? What is their, what, what, what are they consuming that, 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 that led from generational to generational to generational to have this kind of, a, of, a, of hatred? It's, uh, you know, you, 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 like I said, it's our, our, our God is a very peaceful, it's a, a loving God. It's not this God of hate, God of war. So you just wonder, because people are influenced all the time and it's all, it's always propaganda. It's, it's yeah. who's doing what and what is, what is the agenda of this person that's pushing all this propaganda in the, in the first place? Because that's that's what it boils down to. You can you can feed people propaganda and to turn them to evil, same way yeah. as you can actually brainwash people and actually turn them to good. You know, because I was talking to that fella and and it dawned on me that 
I've been telling everybody about this movie that I wanted to be like my dad, that me and my brothers wanted to be like my dad. And then what are we talking about? These terrorists want to be like their dad. And you know what? If my dad was a terrorist, I'd want to be a terrorist. I mean, think about it. if you grew up like that. And mm -hmm. this, the soldiers played this phone call for me of this 18 year old kid that calls out, that calls his, his mom on the phone and says, mom, is dad there? She said, no, he's at work. And he said, mom, mom, I killed 10 Jews. I killed 10 Jews. And the mom's screaming and jumping and they're so happy. And wow. the soldiers played that for me. And it's, he didn't care who they were. He just killed 10 women, children. You know, it was like, it's become so insane. And it's, and, and, for some reason, CNN and the media push this narrative that that's the Jews. When I see God's nature in there, every, I can't, I can't get, I couldn't give a pocket knife away. Nobody wanted a pocket knife for a gift. I, um, I, I, uh, they all say, forget, we forget, we want peace. We, we'll forgive them if we can only have peace. I mean, they have such a gentle, wow. peaceful nature about them. It reminds me of Jesus, the family that Jesus would be in. I mean, I think. I would want to hang these people upside down. I want to burn them. I would want to kill them if they did what, what I just heard. The soldiers played that tape, but I wouldn't watch it. But just the scream from this baby that was enough to just, I thank God I didn't see that thing. It would have torn me up. But I'm telling you, stuff that happened in those kibbutzes, especially that Berai kibbutz, when those t when those guys throw a hand grenade in those little cement houses, there's a pop mark every inch, every diameter, every inch solid covers the whole room. There's no way you could live in there with a grenade toss. And, and they killed, and the, the, the people that were, to were dying were just tormented by passersby. It, it's... And, and I love my fans and I have a lot of Arab fans, but I know there are people in Israel that want peace and they're not, I don't think all of them could be like this. There are a lot and Israel is furious and they're going to kill every one of them of, of Hamas and Hezbollah because this, they have to live like this with in, the rockets are going to come in at any minute. And this is how we live. And they just decide to pull our children over in the cars and kill them. And no other country would tolerate that. But we sure tell Israel, you need to tolerate that. You stay out of there. Who are we? Our yeah. children are being tormented and tortured like that. Anyway, I just had to say, I, I, it no, dawned on me. I said, I would be a terrorist too because my I love my dad so much. I would do it. So there you have it. It's a dead man years ago that is responsible for this hate. You know, a lot of dead men. Yeah. Okay, that's what, that's what they, the, the propaganda, what they, they keep... Uh, teaching over and over again to me it's like just the same way you can you can reprogram people to be good you can yeah. program them to be evil so it's it's your choice in life as to what route what that you want to take so uh i'm just curious is there anything else like uh going through this while the movie's been going on and everybody's been talking about your family story is there anything else that you would like people to know that you may not have talked about yet <laughs> Maybe this, if anyone out there is ever thinking of suicide because life is so bad, know that there really is a devil and he's telling you all kinds of crap and you just got to stay strong and let crap like you're, you're, you're no good and you're, you'll never get good. You just fight that stuff off because God is in you. A spark of God is in each one of us and you just keep fighting and you don't let that thought prevail. You just kick it out when it comes because it's the devil and he hates every one of us and he wants us dead. And so do your best and don't get tired of it. So I'm, amen. amen. Uh, great, great message. There. Great message. Thank you, Kevin. Tell us again about your event. I'm actually, I'm in free bird territory. I'm, I'm over here from bad street, Atlanta, GA, but I'm going to make the drive to come see you Friday night. Uh, I, oh, I bring hey. my brother with me. He's the one that introduced me to you guys. So, oh, God bless you, man. Look me up when you do. You come too, man. Come, come with him. Yeah, I'm, I, I, I'm out in a different part of the state here right now, but a, a different part of the country, I should say. So, <laughs> okay. I, 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 I'll, I'll be in Texas there a few times. And rest assured, you and I, I would love to love meet, love, love, love be able to shake your hand. Well, thank you, good dads, too. Thanks for having me on your show, and I, I appreciate it. And I, 
I appreciate both of you guys too. Thanks yeah, a lot. Before, before I let you go, is there is there any type of a, an email or way of uh, people to contact you? So if they want you for more speaking engagements uh, to help uh, spread your message and whatever else you, you do, is there a best way for uh, people to contact you? You know, I ought to know that. I'm not sure. Instagram. What is it? Yeah, Instagram. Instagram has got uh, a site on Instagram. So get on there and I'll be glad to. I mean, or work out with my people, but, you know, yeah. that would be great. Yeah. Thank exactly. you. All, all this technology you now, they just kind of go in this guy. I don't know what I'm doing, but I have people around me that do. So yeah, I, 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 say, I don't know some lousy pills, man. <laughs> Kevin, I, I really enjoyed uh, today's conversation. So again, nothing but the best to you there, my friend. And rest assured, I think our paths will, will cross here yet. Thank you, guys. Had a great time. Thank so you. Long. All right. So yeah, man, that was that was very emotional for me because you know, um, you know one, one question I, I I was I actually forgot to ask it was like because I you know never not really knowing him and uh, never really watched I haven't had a chance to watch the movie yet. Was there was there a point in time for him uh, that uh, again? I refer to as you know, everyone has that. Uh, I'll say coming to Jesus Day because some people they live one type of a life, but then you know something will happen in in, in their in that their their life, their travels, or whatever, and uh, you know now they like okay, I, I need to change my ways. So I think you know. Kevin had a lot of weight on his shoulders because Kerry went to the WWE in his later years after the territory, the terrorist story started really getting in bad shape after the brothers started dying. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, when David, when the first brother, well, Jack, their, their oldest brother was five when he got electrocuted, but out of the wrestlers, um, David, which they thought would be the NWA world champion. And then he passed away while he was in Japan it was such a big thing in Texas, Dan. It had the biggest uh, audience ever in pro wrestling at that time. They did a memorial show for David, and they had to put it in Cowboy Stadium. Wow. Uh, and Harry won the belt from Flair that day. Wow. The NWA allowed him to uh, become the champion. But as the next couple of years would progress, and Mike and Chris, the crowds started dwindling down, and then they sold um, the world-class territory to Jerry Jarrett, um, and, they, and then it became the USWA. But Kevin stayed there and tried to keep it going while Kerry went to WWF. So I think Kevin had so much responsibility on his shoulders. And uh, like he said, you know, he felt like he was a bad brother. That hurt me hearing him say that because mm -hmm. he, he, I mean, he's not his brother's keeper. There were, there was decisions that had to be going on that, you know, he only had so much control of. Right. You, 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 I mean, at a certain point in time, you're an adult. You yeah. have to make your adult decisions. I mean, it probably, you can't look for, you know, you can't look for, you know, your mom and your dad. You can't look for your big brother, your big sister. Right. Or, you know, you, you have to make your own decisions, whether that's good, bad, or different. Yeah. And so, you know, he moved off to Hawaii and obviously he needed that time to heal. I mean, I didn't, we didn't go too deep into it, but I'm sure he probably didn't even want to look at pro wrestling at that point. That was what he did with his brothers. And the most powerful statement I've not only heard just in pro wrestling, but maybe in life in general was hearing Kevin say, I used to have five brothers. Now I'm not even a brother. How lonely and how much weight he must have had on his shoulders back then, Dan. No, no, I, no that's where I, I can't imagine. And it's, it's, uh, you know, I have seven other siblings. I couldn't even imagine something like that being, you know, boom, 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 losing people left and right like that. I mean, the, the, the reality is we all will die. And it, it'll be the sad day when when who starts going first. Then it's like, okay, then then it starts to get pared down, pared down, pared down to where you are the last one, the last of the Mohicans. Well, so the next part could go into Dan and Don's toxic masculinity because it, it kind of goes there. But. You know, I think after the boys died, they were heroes to these fans all around the world. They were heroes. Now their heroes have passed away. They need somewhere to put the blame. And I think Fritz, the dad, was the easy place to be like, oh, yeah. he pushed the boys to do this. And if you watch the film, it almost made it like he was the one responsible. And I've listened to almost every interview Kevin's done over the years. He loved his dad. 
his dad was a good man. Yes, I'm sure he made. Oh, that was very, very evident. Just I mean, yes. yeah, my first time ever ever doing. That. I mean, to me, it's like I, I could. He 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 did. I mean, and it was. And it's almost like the film gave like this uh, impression that it was toxic masculinity from the dad that killed the boys, and mm. it's so easy to put that out there, and, but people forget. Fritz was a man that lost five of his sons, Dan. I couldn't imagine losing one of my kids, like what it would do to me. But he had five kids that he lost. Um, And I just I just feel it was so unfair. So what I was watching that in the movie theater, I was literally getting upset. I know I'm just a fan, but, you know, that goes to what I do with dad talk as well. Men are committing suicide seven times higher than women after the age of 21 there there is something that is going on up here and then when you go in the 80s these guys were so famous and they lived in the era of drugs you know sex drugs and rock and roll let's just be honest they were in the business they probably could have access to whatever they wanted and you know we all make mistakes i made mine when i was that age thank god i i'm living to tell the story now but um well, no, just you, you and I, when, we've talk, when, when, when you and I have talked to, uh, about professionals, I always say all the time, I'm, I'm like a broken record. It's the worst industry I've ever been involved in, okay, yeah. uh, for all the stuff we talked about, just because the alcohol, just the women and the, the, the drugs that are that are up all over the place. But it's kind of like going, it still boils down to you, the individual, you know, are you going to be... Is it easier to simply just go along with the crowd or you have to stay in there and be different and, and now face some of the ridicule in, in a lot of different ways? Yeah. I mean, and to be the only one, like here's this movie that was made and you know how wrestling is, man. You got all these boys making stories about the Von Erics doing these shoot interviews and over the years, Kevin's probably having to hear about this person saying his brother did this or his dad did this. And he's the only one left to defend right. all these people. Yeah. Man, the responsibility that must have been for him to say he felt like he was letting down his brothers is like, man, he's been an inspiration to me. There's no telling how many people because that's a strong person to yeah. endure all them years. Um, I don't think he's going to say that about himself, but I was thoroughly impressed with that interview. That's. That was the mecca of pro wrestling interviews for me. Well, no good. I, I loved all the questions you asked there. To me, like on that, that all good, all good on that. Yeah. So, who I guess uh, is there anything else coming up for this coming week that we're um, going to do? We got a lot of guests. Uh, okay, so all, some, all in the works. Maybe, maybe we'll, all in the works. What some big ones? Some big ones. I was actually shocked. Uh, that I heard from some of these guys that I don't want to announce it uh, too sure. soon. I've been working on this one with Kevin for a while. And then, you know, it, it happened last minute. So you never know who's going to pop up on sure. Unleashed yeah. with Dan the B Severn and Eric Carroll. Yes. I think that on, on that note, I think I will bid you adieu and then, then we'll, we'll talk again. All right, man. <laughs>